Well, good evening, everyone. Uh, really exciting to introduce all of these amazing people to you all this evening. Jay Smith, unfortunately, can't be with us. He's up in the mountains. He may join us a little bit later. Uh, Murad sends his apologies as well. Um, perhaps he may join us a little bit later if he's if it's possible. Um, so I'm I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself. Um, perhaps Bala, if you could introduce yourself to the audience first. Namaste to everybody. Uh, namaste, Lloyd, Odon, Paul. Uh, it's it's been a long time since uh, I spoke on this platform, and uh, uh, today's topic interested me a lot because. Uh, this is something which I'm interested in. My area of interest lies in uh, the point that uh, Islam originated in the Umayyad period and uh, all its vital uh, organs of Islam, such as uh, Mecca, uh, which is in the Quran, I believe uh, originated in the Umayyad period. So I felt that this is very much within uh, um, my domain. So I've uh, come here to share my two cents. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, Lloyd, how about you introduce oh. yourself? All right. Well, thank you for Mal for having me on. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lloyd de Jong. I am South African. I live in Warsaw, Poland, and I spent 11 years living in the Middle East. I worked in a national defense role. I was responsible for consulting as well as practical implementation of border security and critical national infrastructure systems which were there to defend various Middle Eastern countries against incursions for, and acts of sabotage or destruction by groups like Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and the Iranian National Guards Corps. And um, yeah, I spent a lot of time immersed in the culture. I've traveled extensively across the entire Middle East, and uh, I saw a lot of these places firsthand. So I've been everywhere from Northern Iraq to the Bekaa Valley in the Lebanon. And uh, so I've seen a lot of these issues and the dysfunction up close and personal, and thus I became very interested in what caused this. So I've got lots of practical experience within the region with the people and my expertise and what I cover on my channel is Islamic law, what is known as the Sharia and the Fiqh of Islam. So I do detailed studies of the Islamic law across the four schools. And also I study the Sira of Islam, which is the, they're known as the biographies of Muhammad, but really they are the gospels of Muhammad. And within the Sira, really it's where Muhammad's deity is discussed. And, and also um, one point that I will raise before we get, is that within the Islamic law, within the, within the Sharia, within the Fiqh, Islam is explicitly stated to be a Gnostic religion. It is explicitly called Gnosticism it is, and the, the scholars are explicitly called Gnostics. Can't hear you. Lloyd, uh, thank you very much. And sorry about the, the mute. Um, Paul Ellis, could you introduce yourself, please? Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Paul. I uh, live in London. I'm a former barrister. I'm now a teacher. And um, I've been very interested in Islam, particularly, and not as long as many people, for about sort of four years or so. Uh, my particular interest is in the Quran itself, in interpreting the Quran um, in the light of its biblical um subtext and its antecedents and trying to work out what the quran um actually means that i think there's a lot of um perception that at least there was when i started uh, getting taking an interest um that the uh, that the quran itself is basically jumbled up nonsense it's full of mistakes it doesn't doesn't actually mean anything leap from one topic to another for no obvious reason my experience um of reading books and articles on it by academics is that there's a great purpose and a meaning and a structure to the Quran uh, that's historical. So I'm very much interested in teasing this out, say, job, which I think which is vitally important and which the human race has only really been making a serious attempt at in the last 50 years. Um, and, and we've still got a great, very, very long way to go. So that's my particular interest. Perhaps, um, if I may say, I just push my own, my own little theory. Um, the, the, the one theory I've uh, come up with that I think has gained the most traction is what I call the Jerusalem thesis, and that is that the Masjid al-Haram um, is in fact the Jerusalem temple or, or the site of the Jerusalem temple, and that when the Quran talks about um, expel them from where they have expelled you, I put this in the context of the Byzantine-Sasanian war, 
and it's uh, Muhammad was actually leading a military expedition to capture Jerusalem. And that's my uh, that's my uh, big idea upon which many of my other ideas hang. Okay, um, thank you, Paul. I'm just going to respond to a question in the in the chat there. Someone asked for my email, sneakerscorner at hotmail.com. Okay, and now I'm going to pass on to Odin, who will be familiar to many in the audience. Uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Thank you. Hi, um, hello, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mel, for having me. Uh, yes, I'm Odon Lafontaine. I live in Paris, and it's been uh, 10 years plus or more since I've been working on Islam, especially with Dr. Edouard Marie Gallet, or Gallez, who wrote a thesis about the origins of Islam in 2004. Uh, I've published uh, a book, The Great Secret of Islam, the Le Grand Secret de l'Islam, with him, um, which explains his thesis and develops it um, in the light of new discoveries and mostly what uh, Gales and what the scholars are about to discover, to discover is that the um, Islam at the origin uh, did not exist as the is standard Islamic narrative to, told us, but it was about the, um, the waiting of the Messiah in Jerusalem. Uh, and I think Paul, uh, <coughs> Paul is on the very right track here. Um, people were waiting for the Messiah to come in Jerusalem. He did not come. He did not establish God's kingdom on us. And then the Arab leaders uh, took it upon themselves to establish God's kingdom on us and created Islam to justify the, um, their power. And so, <clears throat> and here may, maybe we will have a, a little debate with, with Lloyd. At the beginning, Islam was very much a messianism, not as much as a Gnosticism, but it evolved into a Gnosticism, I think, due to the, the construction of the religion and the many influences of Shia Islam and, and Persian uh, and, and uh, Eastern religions and creeds. So, and about Jerusalem and Mecca, uh, I think Mecca is a complete forgery. There was no Mecca at the beginning. And Mecca was created in order to, to give some flesh uh, to the standard Islamic narrative and to um, comply with what the Quran says. But the Quran is not about Mecca, it's about Jerusalem, as Paul uh, explained it. And so they created Mecca. Uh, in a two-step uh, fashion, first as uh, the new place of Abraham, and secondly uh, as the place of origin, the, the place of birth of the prophet, and they um, create it uh, so that it mimics what the Quran tells about uh, Jerusalem. Okay, um, thank you, um, Odin. Um, you kind of led into what my opening question was going to be. It's, it's just simply we're going to be asking the question, why do we think Mecca was chosen and so on? But first of all, I suppose to start off, um, what is your opinion about the idea that it wasn't there in the early days, that it wasn't there, at, say, in the early 7th century when Islam was meant to have begun? So just like to do a round robin with you all. Um, Bala, um, what's your view on this idea that there was no Mecca in the beginning? Well, uh, I would like to stick to Patricia Crohn's uh, words that uh, the incense route between Yemen and Syria uh, could not include Mecca because it was uh, uh, out of the way for that uh, uh, particular uh, trade route because um, the ancient uh, civilization was turning into the med medieval ages and uh, the cities were supposed to lie on trade routes such as the Silk Route or the Incense Route or the Musk Route etc etc so it was basically trade which was connecting different civilizations and mecca i think was uh, a, a way too uh, far away from the uh, usual traditional route so i think uh, it has no sense to exist and of course the other historical antecedents and uh, the other uh, sources also corroborate uh, what uh, patricia crown has uh, told us so there was no mecca um, 
let's say at least till six uh, six nineties or six ninety five. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, Paul, do you want to maybe give a summary of your thoughts on this question of Mecca? Thank you. Yeah, uh, in terms of the the place uh, Mecca in Hijaz, uh, there's no. There's, I think it's fair to say that there is absolutely no evidence that it existed um, in the in the seventh in the early seventh century or the mid seventh century. There's not a, a shred of evidence, not a shard of pottery, not a coin, not a single inscription, not a mention anywhere. There's, there is simply no evidence that it was ever there. I think it's uh, that doesn't prove that there was nothing there, but there's no reason to think that there was anything there and no reason to uh, to imagine that there was anything there, given the climate, the inhospitable territory, the lack of any obvious um, um, advantage in its position. Uh, it's not on a trade route. It's, it's, it, it, there's no reason to think that there's anything there. Um, on the other hand, one two things that I find quite intriguing are that there is something that ties in with Islam. There are two things, physical objects, um, that don't seem to play any part in the Quran story and seem to appear at Mecca, and they're connected to Mecca. Uh, one of them is the black stone. Uh, it's, to me, it's inconceivable that the person who wrote the Quran would have had any sympathy at all for people parading around a black stone or kissing a black stone or anything like this. This seems exactly the sort of thing that, that the Quran author would have been horrified at and would, would have beheaded anyone who, who suggested such a thing. The other one, which is slightly more mysterious, is the Makam Ibrahim, the standing place of Abraham. Uh, there's this object which, as it happens, is only is only a few yards away from the black stone. It's a block that's got two great um, indentations in it, which in some way look like stylized footprints, but they're not really footprints. Um, Islamic tradition has some uh, rather half-baked idea that this is where Abraham stood, and that's why the Quran talks about the standing place of Abraham, or standing place of Abraham. Well, here's a block of stone with two footprints in it. That, that, that's where he stood. Um, but it just doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the story at all. Uh, there's no reason why Abraham would have stood on this block and have sunk into it, or why he had such huge feet. Um, no, nobody can really make any sense of it. So it looks to me as though there is a, a black stone and you've got the Makam Ibrahim. And whether they were at Mecca in the Hijaz, and and there was some temple there, and uh, and and the Muslims came and and Islamified it, or whether they have a totally different story that began somewhere else and was brought there. I have something of an open open mind about at the moment, but there is there is something there that's not Islamic. That would be my my main observation. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I know this is not your main area of focus, Lloyd, but would you like to? Give any thoughts in relation to that question of Mecca? A couple of thoughts. Um, I do agree with Bala that Mecca is not on the trade route. It's too far west of the, of the land route and it's too far east of the sea route. And Patricia Crone does ask what commodities enable the inhabitants of this barren site to engage in commerce on what was so, apparently such a large scale. And there is no evidence before what the 8th or 9th century to verify that, that Mecca existed. So there's no early record of it. And uh, I will note that from Islamic law, lying is explicitly allowed within Islam. And in fact, um, just as the Eskimos have like 20 words for snow, Islam has something like 20 words for lying, right? And everyone knows about Takia, but there's like, there's a whole bunch of others that they've never heard of. So if lying benefits Islam, then lying is not only permissible but obligatory and if lying causes confusion and ignorance in others and if this is of benefit to islam then this is permissible so there's no reason to believe anything that you're told and along with that i would say that perhaps they wanted a place that was completely barren a blank slate where they could start fresh with their with their utopian caliphate and they could just start with a new narrative and establish themselves. They wanted something free of history, free of any kind of associations. That may be the case. Um, let me just see if my audio is on yet. And uh, over to Odin, what's your thoughts on that whole question? Oh, I fully agree with everyone here. Um, 
I, I would like to to point at an, an argument that Muslims often make about Mecca. They say that the absence of proof is not the proof of absence. Uh, but in this case, we just have to look at the, the positive evidence we have for um, uh, an Islamic Mecca. And as Paul uh, stated it, there is none. There is absolutely none uh, in terms of um, facts, uh, artifacts, coins, relics, archaeology. And the only evidence there is, is scriptural evidence. It is the Sirah, it is the Islamic tradition. But when we really look into the Sirah and the Islamic tradition, we see that everything that pertains to Mecca actually points to Jerusalem. And so the evidence, the only evidence, the only Islamic evidence there is, crumbles, collapses. And this forces us to, to think that there was no Mecca at all, and that Mecca is uh, a pure invention, a complete invention. And <clears throat> I have um, other points to make, but um, th this first one, I think, is, is very important. The only Islamic evidence is no evidence at all. Okay, um, there is a viewer that has mentioned that your audio is a bit low, Odin. So um, feel free to pull out your um, microphone if that helps. Um, I have a question to kind of fo to follow up that last question, which is um, surely they would have picked a location with biblical links to support the general narrative, um, but they picked a place with no biblical links from, from at least on the face of it. Would you like to just give your thoughts on why they picked a place that was so barren and and so devoid of biblical links. Um, so that's a sort of an open question. Who would like to take a stab at that? Uh, Paul, thank you. Yeah, I mean, I'm very struck um, by the image of Tom Holland in his documentary, Islam, The Untold Story. Um, and has this great, uh, it, it, he talks, he hints at the Jerusalem thesis, but he doesn't come out and say it. It spends a lot of time showing um, pictures and footage of Jerusalem and hinting that that's where it all was, but he doesn't actually say this is where, this is where the Quran is talking about. And then he moves to a, a scene where he's walking through the desert, it's almost knee high in, in the shifting sands, and the camera is panning around him and he says, uh, I forget the exact words, but uh, all you see is emptiness. You, you come to the desert, you think you're on the outside of the desert and you think it's empty. And then you come into the desert and all you see is emptiness. And, and I think that's a very uh, compelling image. Um, I also um, uh, very much uh, like your analogy, uh, Mel, and I've mentioned it in the past, and uh, I, I love it, the, I, the comparison with Las Vegas, where, where you create, you can create any fantasy you want to in the, uh, in the desert. There's no, uh, there are no people, there's no history, there's, no, there's nothing to build around it. You can have your own little, little fantasy there. So why, why they went to the Hijaz, in, in my view, is, is, is essentially negative. They wanted to have no biblical associations. That's, that's not um, a, a mystery, a scratching your head. Why did they go somewhere with no, that, that? That's the per point of it. If they wanted somewhere with biblical associations, they would have stuck with the truth. And the truth is that uh, the, the, the Quran is largely about Jerusalem and about the Jewish people and the Judeo-Christian tradition. That's what the Quran is really about. The reason do they put it somewhere else is to make it negative to make it inaccessible to create an entirely fictitious and that's and once you're there it doesn't really matter what what the story is uh, the story just has to fit around the words of the quran as far as possible but the the point is to separate it i would i would take um i respectfully uh, slightly disagree with something that, that lloyd said if i if i may great great respect to to lloyd um i don't think they were trying to build anything in mecca the evidence I see from early Islam is that Mecca was not much more prominent after um, after the Arab conquests uh, than it was before. 
um, we talk about the manuscripts and the different um, and the different uh, stemma of um, of the of the early manuscripts, and you talk about uh, the Basran and the um, the Baskan and and, uh, and the Jerusalem traditions, and 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 you don't really have a, a Meccan. There's one there's one single manuscript I think that they that they call the Meccan tradition, but there's no obvious link with Mecca as far as I could see. And one talks about the legal traditions, we talk about jurists, and again, they're all from Damascus, or they're from Basra, or they're from further further east, or they're in that, that world. They're not, um, the Me there's not a Me strong Meccan legal tradition. And so one gets the feeling that not many people went to Mecca um, in, in, the first, in the first century or two. It doesn't. It doesn't seem they were building anything there. It was a. It was a name that was just deliberately put somewhere where nobody was ever likely to go. I'm going to take. Okay, um, Balad, you would like to come in on that. Uh, well, uh, the story of Islam, uh, at least for its uh, first century and a half, seems to be a struggle between the Umayyads and the non-Umayyads on the other side, uh, and the Prophet and uh, the other people seem to belong to the non made stream. So it is a tussle between the, the effort to put Mecca uh, far away from the Umayyad political and religious control uh, seems to be the focus of the person or the group of persons who shifted uh, the black stone from uh, somewhere in the Umayyad territory or the border of the Umayyad territory deep down into the desert uh, where the Umayyad armies or the long arms of the Umayyad Caliphate uh, cannot reach. So that seems to be the uh, primary motive uh, of the person or the group of people who uh, shifted uh, Mecca to that place. Now, why could it not have been Medina, where they could have shifted the black stone, uh, is because the uh, the Puritan, uh, the Puritanical or the uh, initial Muslims and their descendants, uh, the, the believers, I mean, I, I, I'm sorry, I used the word Muslims, the initial believers and their descendants seems to have, seem to have dwelled in Medina. So this particular site had to be uh, at Medina or anywhere southern uh, territories to Medina, not too close to Yemen because they have a very other uh, distinct uh, Sabian uh, or uh, cult that they followed. So they wanted to balance between uh, this Medinian territory and the Yemeni territory. As you will see in the later Umayyad period, these two developed into two different parties, and the northern Qais party and the southern Yemeni party. Uh, which played a huge role in the, uh, you know, Umayyad politics in the later Umayyad empire. So the, the whole point is they chose that this site was chosen, the geography was chosen to keep it away from Umayyad uh, hands. And what is odd is I've already mentioned in the uh, chat and I'm talking to friends in the live chat as well, is that uh, usually victors get to write history. Winners take it all. But here the Umayyads were the victors. However, uh, for reasons beyond their control, okay, uh, the religious, the political religious uh, seat of the caliphate got split, and the uh, Umayyads remain only political figures. Whereas the re religious figures crowded at Kufa or uh, Medina, way far away from Damascus and Jerusalem, and and they made sure that uh, the Umayyads don't have a say in the making or the evolution of nascent Islam. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Lloyd, would you like to come in on that? Uh, no comment. I'll listen for a while and I'll, I'll uh, see what if I have I, something I else have I can a, comment. I on. have a comment. Okay. I came, I come, just come to the rescue of Lloyd. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I don't think the, um, the point you made about the Umayyad um, uh, Bala is that valid because uh, I think Mecca was chosen as a place of origin of Islam by the Abbasids. Uh, way after they conquered uh, the power, and there were no uh, <coughs> no more Umayyads to to challenge them. And uh, but I agree with you, the place had to be remote, had to be um, re remote from the Judeo-Christian Levant, from the Jewish and Christian Yemen, and also I think um, this is an idea I got from a, a scholar friend. Um, it had to be remote from Baghdad because uh, you see the Abbasid coalition that, that took the, the took the power from from the Umayyads was formed with uh, warriors 
Arabs, mostly Persians, and a sort of um, religious core, um, I think mostly uh, made by Shia or future Shia, Shia Muslims. And um, I think the central power of Baghdad wanted the religious away from them. Uh, they, they also choose Mecca to, to keep them away and, and to not have them um, at the very center of their power. And this is also, I think, one of the reasons why it is so, so remote. And, and all of the other reasons, it is an empty place which has no history, no one to challenge the reconstruction of a new, a new ideological history. All of this is very, uh, very legit, very, very valid, I think. But we also have to, to take into account the, the, the very odd nature of the Abbasid power, which was uh, a mix of warriors and religious people with very strange ideas. Okay, um, it sounds to me that Mecca was kind of like the Goldilocks location in the sense that it was just far enough south, not too near the north, not too near the south where the Yemenis are, not too near the sea, so it just happened to be in the right location. Um, it seems to me that there was nothing significant about that. Bala, do you want to come in on that? Yeah, um, uh, I want to respond to Odon. Uh, uh, Odon, I think uh, uh, we see the first non-Muslim mention of Mecca in 742 AD mm -hmm. in uh, Continuato uh, Byzantium. So uh, the, the place Mecca was uh, recognized and even you know Dan Gibson also says that the first uh, uh, Mecca-facing uh, mosque was made in uh, Banbor in Pakistan in 727. So mm -hmm. what happens is the, the site has come up well within the Umayyad period, which is my um, mm -hmm. field of study. Because I, so, I think so. Uh, I think, think so also. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so it is the Abbasids uh, would have liked to shift uh, shifted the place from Mecca to back where it was actually. Uh, I would come up with the three uh, Kaaba uh, hypothesis uh, in a while. Mm -hmm. The three Islamic uh, three uh, Kaaba hypothesis uh, in a while, but. Uh, uh, the uh, site of Mecca is certainly pre abbasid That's what uh, I'm trying to tell here, Odo. Thank mm -hmm. you. I also think the site is uh, is, is pre abbasid that, There is another point we we should really um, have in mind. Um, it is it is all the this thing with the black stone, as as Paul said it, the the, the cult of the black stone is not Islamic. It is something very different, very ancient, and um, the, the proto-Islamic creed could not have been about the black stone. This is something else. So I think maybe that the, the Umayyad uh, Mecca, when the Umayyad took over Mecca and established something there, maybe it had something to do with the black stone. And maybe this is why the first... Uh, mosques were pointed to this site, Mecca, the, the, especially the, the Bambo Mosque in, in Pakistan. Okay, um, maybe oh, I'd um, Mel, open it up to anyone there. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, Mel, we are given to understand that uh, there were these three uh, Kaabas, that is the, the black one that was somewhere in northwestern Arabia, somewhere near Petra. Then there was a white Kaaba with the Lakomets. Uh, who were centered at Hiras near Kufar Basra. And then there was a red colored Kaaba, which was in, in uh, Yemen, uh, which was the uh, center of the Sabian uh, worship in Yemen. Now, uh, they wanted to have a midpoint between these three Kaabas so that there can be a reconciliation between these uh, three mm -hmm. different, uh, the Ghazanids, the Lakomets, and uh, the, uh, the Sabians or the uh, Yemeni people. So they wanted to have a midpoint between this um, uh, that is what I'm trying to tell you. Was it was not even in the center of the Zubair Caliphate, uh, where uh, Ibn al Zubair can, uh, you know, go ahead and place it right in the middle of his uh, Caliphate, maybe somewhere near a uh, little more further north, near Muta or uh, near Tabuk, uh, which is places associated, uh, generally associated with the Prophet. Now, being the spiritual son of uh, the Prophet, uh, you could have reckoned uh, it to have been placed somewhere in Mecca 
or tabuk or uh, muta or even taif, uh, just like uh, uh, someone in the comment section is suggesting that it could have been there. So they, I think they're trying to figure out a, a, a geometrical midpoint between this black, white, and uh, red covers. That is my hypothesis. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I suppose thoughts on that. Sorry. Yeah. Yes. Um. I'll go ahead with your with your point. Sorry, Lloyd. No. On that, I mean, it definitely sounds valid, and uh, Bala knows more about that than I do. Um, but also, if they were in a more populated urban center, the the fact of the Islamic plagiarism, the the syncretism from all of these different religious and um, Gnostic traditions would be instantly recognized. If they shifted it away from from a place, mm -hmm. well, if they shifted it to somewhere remote, the, the plagiarism wouldn't be noticed and they could then get away with growing this nascent form of Islam. If they were in Jerusalem, they'd, they'd, be, they'd be known immediately for having stolen from this group, stolen from that group, taken from the Talmud, taken from this tradition, that tradition, the, the Manichaeans, you name it. They swiped from everybody. So I think it, it, it suited a number of different, um, well, it, it gave them, it, it suited a number of different criteria that they may have had, and it gave them this ability to, to hide that the fact that they'd simply just created this thing. Okay, so um, mm -hmm. an idea that I have in my head is perhaps, was there a secret agreement with the Byzantines? The Byzantines were not happy with them occupying the holy site for Jews and Christians, and they basically agreed to pull back to another location. Does, could that carry any water, or do you think it actually, no, it's more a case of they just needed a blank slate? Probably not. Hi. I, I think I think as, as I as I mentioned before, that the aim is to try and separate um, to separate the Quran from its meaning, and to create an entirely fictitious life of Muhammad to separate it from what what really happened. And my reading of the Quran now is very much that Muhammad, oh, I'll call him the Muhammad, the principal author, the guiding the guiding mind behind the Quran, uh, saw himself as a new Moses. And he was he saw the opportunity to invade Palestine and he clothed himself in all the language, all the biblical and uh, and um, Judeo-Christian language uh, to give himself the, the trappings of a new Moses. And he is all his um, um, polemics against the Jews uh, were, were all against the uh, to say, well, the, the, the children of Israel have had their chance and now it's time for the children of Ishmael to, to take over. God has, uh, has given up on them. He's uh, replaced, something, replaced them with something better. So he's very much, the, the Quran itself is, a, is, a, is saturated with biblical references. And, um, and, and the aim is, is simply to separate, and the aim of Mecca, like so much, like the whole of the narrative, is to, is to separate the, the Quran from its true meaning. Um, there are a couple of points that, that uh, the guys have um, made. Uh, one is is Bala seemed to say, and it's a it's a view I'm I'm not committed on, but I'd uh, I'd very much welcome if he could uh, go into a little more detail of his thoughts. Uh, he seemed to say that the uh, black stone um, was taken to Mecca, that it was somewhere else, and then it was the thing was probably taken to Mecca. And that's, of course, uh, Dan Gibson, the heart of Dan Gibson's uh, thesis, that um, that uh, Abdullah al ibn al Zubair was besieged, and he evacuated the black stone and and sent it into the Hijaz for safekeeping, and then um, and then uh, and, and then he was defeated, and his people are left. Basically, holding this, this this sacred relic, and they set up a shrine, and that later became merged with with the story of Islam. Uh, is is that is that uh, is is that Bala? What you think? Some some story a, a little like that. Uh, the uh, the other point yeah. that, that was mentioned is um, perhaps perhaps it's mixing two ideas together. Uh, we were talking about uh, the the Arab Byzantine Chronicle, and and how that mentions Mecca. But that mentions Mecca, but it puts it up in the Mesopotamia. So it's got the name Mecca, which of course is in the Quran itself, but not Mecca in Hijaz, is it? Yeah, I just want to jump in on that one. It could my my sense of it is perhaps they knew that it was 
at the location of one of the stations of Abraham and they assumed maybe that it was it was somewhere like Ur or Haran or somewhere like that. And that's how it got all mixed up. But uh, yeah, go ahead, uh, Lloyd. Thanks. Um, just to note that while there are these references to Moses and Muhammad does claim himself to be the successor of Moses, shall we say, it's when you go into the various Sira, the quote unquote biographies, but really the gospels of Muhammad, that you discover that Muhammad is the, he becomes the counterfeit Jesus. He becomes the new Jesus, where Jesus is what they call the Messiah. Muhammad becomes the king Messiah. So he one-ups Jesus in every single way. Now, it should also be noted that for lay Muslims, and we are not even Muslims, so we're not at that level of, shall we say, initiation, the Quran sits at a level of knowledge that the scholars call the Ibara, which is the plain level. It's the absolute bottom lowest level of knowledge. Mm -hmm. And lay Muslims are not allowed knowledge above this level. There are three additional levels, the Ishara, the Lata'if, and the Haqqa'iq. So if you're only studying what's in the Quran, which is quite literally um, termed Islam for the masses, the Ibarra level is Islam for the masses, Islam for the plebs. And the, the greater knowledge of these further three levels are for the initiates, the scholars, then, then you have one perception of Islam. But once you get into the Sharia, which the Ijma is the, when you take all of the knowledge that's in the Quran, in the Hadith, in the Sirah and so on, and there's all these opinions and the Quran is abrogated, the Hadith are abrogated, Hadith abrogate Quran, Quran abrogates Hadith and they all abrogate each other. Then you've got all these opinions in the Tafsir. But once you sort all of this mess out, you have the Ijma. Mm -hmm. And the Ijma, the consensus is found within the Sharia and the Fiqh. So to look beyond the Quran, mm -hmm. so the ultimate knowledge of what's in the Quran is in the Ijma, which is found in the Sharia. And that's where you get additional knowledge. And that also, once you look at the Sira, you look at the the deeper personality, the legends, the myths, the miracles of Muhammad, then you discover he's he's the replacement of Jesus and and so on. So you get a different perspective as well that adds knowledge that you wouldn't have from reading the Quran alone, which is designed to be vague. So mm -hmm. Now, the time period that we are talking about, uh, Islam was uh, very fluid. It was not so concrete or rigid uh, like uh, Lloyd is saying. I I'd like to respond to Paul. Mm, yes, Paul, uh, I would like to uh, subscribe uh, to the uh, views of Dan Gibson as far as uh, the Zubair revolt is uh, concerned. And and looking at uh, the perspective of the origins of the Momnin movement, the believers movement itself, it seems to be a rebellion against the Sasanian uh, rule because um, I like, uh, I request all our uh, friends here and the listeners also to refer to a map given by Khodad uh, Reza Khani. Uh, in his uh, uh, book, uh, Reorienting the Sasanians. Now, in that, he refers that in 621, uh, Khusro had essentially encircled uh, Arabia from all sides. Egypt belonged to him. Yemen and Oman was his. Uh, he was from Persia. Uh, he had covered up the entire uh, Levant region and he had gone up till Turkey. So all the territory that was left out for the Prophet was the Hijaz region. Hijaz region. Now, in that region, uh, all the sacredness of uh, what is the true ethos of the Arab culture uh, had accumulated there with the uh, Lakhmids uh, being uh, decimated, uh, the Ghazanids being compromised, and Abu Sufyan himself being uh, that. And uh, we see that Mecca itself is a, a copy or replica of some other center which was falling in the Sasanian territory at that point in time, in 621, just before the uh, pre uh, Hijra uh, period. So uh, initially it started off as a rebellion against the Sassanids. And once they were successful against the Sassanids, they turned their attention against the Byzantines, just like uh, Mel mentioned. Uh, their focus was to uh, de Romanize or de Byzantize uh, their culture because they understood that there are a lot of elements of the uh, Ghassanid uh, uh, culture or the Ghassanid kingdom which was completely Romanized. So they wanted to de-Romanize it and the inclusion of these ancient pagan rituals such as uh, stoning the devil uh, at uh, Mina, uh, the three pillars there and going around uh, circumambulating um, a, a particular structure or uh, the, the relishing the memory of uh, Abraham's footprints uh, to show that this is also part of the promised land. So all these activities uh, point out to the fact that they wanted to de and 
they wanted to de-Romanize their new uh, found uh, cult, and they believed that they were God chosen ones, and the apocalypse was at hand, and that they were, uh, and, they, and that they were living at the end of time, at the edge of history, or whatever you want to call it, and they believed that they were the ones uh, who were the uh, saved ones, and Muhammad will be the first one to be resurrected, like Jesus was resurrected uh, seven hundred years ago. So they sincerely believed in all these things. I think we need to get into their minds and talk like them and argue like them uh, to get more closer to the truth. Um, thank you. Um, I just wanted to respond to something Lloyd mentioned about the Gnostic readings of the Quran. I, I was talking to a member of the Alawites there um, about a week ago, and one of the things he mentioned was that in their faith, they are conscious of different layers of meaning. So it's very explicit there. Um, I think the same would be said for the Druze as well. Um, and they're very much influenced by Neoplatonistic ideas. Um, and I think if we were to do um, like a heat map of uh, Syria and uh, Lebanon and so on, where the different sects are, I think we'd really get to um, the source of a lot of these ideas. Um, I wanted to um, ask you, why would the the Abbasids confirm a place like Mecca. Let's say the Umayyads had decided upon this place. Um, surely it was in the Abbasids' interest to make their own place. So just throw that out to you. Anyone like to respond to that question? Why did the Abbasids stick with this location? Why did they not find another location more suitable for themselves? Okay. Firstly, um, the, firstly, the Umayyads had, uh, were the victors in 695, and they could have uh, relocated it back to from wherever it was, <laughs> but they didn't choose to do so because they felt that holding on to political power, and they did not want a repetition of a Zubairid uh, or a Mukhtarite or a Hussein kind of a revolt ever again. I'm just giving you examples. The, uh, these things may or may not have happened. Uh, Umayyads were uh, focused on the fact that there should be no more uh, political rebellion from the fringes of the their empire, and they just want to keep their uh, uh, place secure. So that is why Umayyads avoided the uh, change of the territory. Okay. Now coming to the Abbasids, the Abbasids also did not want to disturb the status quo because the initial first 50 years of the Abbasid Caliphate till the uh, um, middle of the rule of uh, Harun al Rashid was a very very troublesome period because they were more invested in uh, fighting against the rebellions of. Uh, someone like Ustad Sis or uh, 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 or the followers of Behaparad or uh, the uh, followers of Sunpad or the followers of Abu Muslim. So they were invested in fighting out and quelling the rebellions and the fires that were lit by, uh, you know, uh, Al Mukanna, you know, uh, way in the far east. So they did not bother much about this and they felt that it was a very, very safe place to uh, keep uh, that. But they had essentially shifted the political religious center to Baghdad. The epicenter of Islam was very much at Baghdad during the uh, first 200 years of the Abbasids. Okay, does anyone else want to come in on that or even open up a, a new area of discussion? Uh, so I'm going to open the floor okay, a little is bit. It, is it, hello, is it possible that I could uh, make, a, make a comment on what Bala said? Yes, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I found what Bala said very, very interesting uh, before. It, 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 particularly this, this distinction between the Umayyads and the Abbasids, the, the, it seems to me that the Umayyads, the lie, if I regard it all as a, as a big lie, the, um, the traditional life of Muhammad, uh, it's, uh, it's not uh, a case of exaggeration or people forgetting things or building up pious, pious fictions to be spiritually uplifting. I, I, I see the whole thing as, uh, as essentially dishonest and an attempt to obscure the truth. And the question uh, is why? Why were people trying to trying to obscure the truth, having got this Quran, which is um, seems to have been very uh, seems to have been somewhat uh, popular. People were making manuscripts. Um, people are creating traditions. So it seems to have got some uh, people have been making laws on it. Um, and so it seems to have had a lot of popular hold. So why were the rulers so anxious to separate it from its from its meaning? We might have expected them 
to be a lot more uh, celebratory of it and regard it as uh, a great moment in, in Arabic civilization, the creation of their first and, uh, and one of their greatest works. But it seems to me that the lie uh, started under the Umayyads. The, the Umayyads um, were the first people, or the, the dishonesty had begun by long, long before 700 and, uh, 750 in the Abbasid Revolution. Um, but the Umayyads, although they were, they were somewhat dishonest um, with their approach, uh, they were still very much of the Judeo-Christian tradition. So they would build the Dome of the Rock, which is a Judeo-Christian shrine, um, possibly Muhammad's mausoleum. I think they were uh, taken by that, by that thesis. Um, and we know that the Umayyads continue to use Christian iconography. There are crosses that appear in some of their inscriptions. We know that they employed uh, John of Damascus, who was a, 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 a Christian uh, in a very senior position. So the Umayyads still seem to have come from the Judeo-Christian tradition. So although they're trying to bury Muhammad, they haven't created yet the completely fictitious circumstance. Uh, but then it's the Abbasids who, who, when they take over in 750, they're the ones who really separate, separate the story from any, any real links with Christianity um, or Judaism. And I find that's, that's very interesting. So the, the Abbasids, one assumes from that, didn't come from a Judeo-Christian tradition at all. They must have come from somewhere maybe to the east or somewhere uh, where they just didn't have that same familiarity or knowledge or respect or adherence to um, the Bible and that they were anxious to create a completely separate connection whereas you may add still wanted to keep that connection somewhat mm -hmm. i agree i uh, fully agree with paul there is something there the the um, the, uh, the may had added a sort of connection with the judeo-christian background and the they try to cut it off and the abbasid uh, followed on and cut it off completely. And uh, we can see this in the creation of Baghdad in itself. Baghdad is a complete new city, an ideological city, an ideal city uh, set with a... It's, it's an, an architect's dream. You see the, the, the map is in, is in shape of a circle and it's a complete new city. And this uh, tells us about the, um, their way of thinking. The Abbasid rulers invented themselves as rulers and, and, and um, as being God's lieutenant. And, uh, so they couldn't invent anything. If you can invent Baghdad, you can invent Mecca. You can invent uh, Siraz after Siraz. You can invent the life of, your, of a prophet. You can invent new meanings to the sacred texts. And I think this was their, their way of thinking. They were the God-chosen rulers of us, so they could do anything, anything they wanted. Let me come out of there. Well, the site um, of Baghdad, uh, Odon, actually, uh, the Abbasids honestly believed that they were the new Babylonians. Mm -hmm. They believed that they were building Baghdad on the site of the ancient Babylon although they had got the site wrong, but they honestly believe that they are the new Babylonians and they are the ones who are here to stay until the end of uh, time, right? So that is about Baghdad. Uh, Mel, I want to make a very important point on the uh, structure of Mecca as we see today. Okay, yeah. it is not like a synagogue. Mecca is not a synagogue. Mecca is not a church. Mecca is trying to point out to something new. What they were trying to do is, they were trying to show with the footprint of Abraham and all the other prophets and all the important relics uh, that were uh, kept around uh, the ancient Mecca. They were trying to show that they have maintained the ancient religion of Moses, saying that this is like the structure of the tabernacle. So they were trying to keep the uh, tabernacle uh, tradition of Moses. Uh, and we know why Moses went for uh, this, uh, uh, this square uh, cube box. He has shifted from the pyramid system to the, um, you know, this this box system. So, uh, just like Paul mentioned, that Muhammad was a new Moses, and Mecca was the new um, center of worship, 
and that was the uh, ancient uh, tabernacle and uh, these believers believe that they uh, they retain the covenant uh, with the true god and all the other religions were polluted the all the judeo christian traditions were polluted so that is what they honestly believe I, i'm asking you all to go back to the mindset of the 7th century and the 8th century mm-hmm. believers and think like them and talk like them even now <laughs> okay i'm going to bring lloyd in i think he wanted to make a point yeah no that's a fair point um, well said bala uh, on that point at least within one of the traditions within the sira the kaaba in mecca is claimed to be the very first building built on earth it's the oldest temple on earth now it's a claim which i don't don't think has any evidence but the claim is made So therefore if they're going back to the root then they're claiming that they are the source of all religions because the the monotheism that they claim that Jesus was a monotheist they claim that Moses was a monotheist and when they speak of monotheism in the old testament or the new testament they are referring to a, a proto islam it's the it's this proto monotheism that preceded islam which was perfected with muhammad so therefore if they're going back to the oldest building on earth then they're going to the root of the of god's own religion of allah's own religion religion so this would so it suits it suits the myth making which is found within the sira okay um i wanted to bring up another kind of area just at the transition between the umayyads and the abbasids we have um uh make sure i got the name um marwan the second uh 744 to 750 and he was stationed in Haran of all places not Baghdad not Damascus not down in Mecca and what's interesting about the location that he picked to have his palace it was the site of the old um god Sen or a temple dedicated to Sen and what's interesting is there is a connection there between Ramadan and the um and that old cult uh, Nabonidus was the the person who spread the cult of the god sin into arabia and they had a 30 day fast um any thoughts on that that whole issue and why why did that not become their center why why was it that they abandoned haran and kept to baghdad or even in fact transfer everything to baghdad any any thoughts on that bella well, uh, you brought up a very interesting point because um Marwan II was the last Umayyad ruler uh, who ruled from Damascus. After that, they shifted to Cordoba. We know that story. Now, he came to power under very uh, interesting circumstances. At the fall of uh, Hisham, uh, the second Walid, and the second Yazid. So th- there was a quick succession of uh, caliphs, and there was a um, very very quick oscillation between the um, Qaisi candidate and the Yemeni candidate. Now he himself being a uh, Kesi candidate he wanted to keep away from the power structure and the power struggles of Damascus now uh, he was the governor of armenia uh, when the his predecessor was uh, killed under mysterious circumstances now he marches into damascus successfully he finds the environment very very uh, dangerous for himself and he moves to haran and haran we know is the site of the famous cult of sin which continued till the time of al mamun at least till 825 or 830 so and the symbol the crescent and the star symbol comes from the cult of haran uh, the the cult of sin and many other symbols and uh, practices of uh, early islam has come from that particular moon worshiping cult and what you said about marwan's behavior and uh, and his attitude was very much uh, in sync with the um, cult of sin however uh, he had too many detractors uh, including uh, uh, the person uh, of zaid uh, ibn ali uh, who was executed in a very brutal manner by hisham in 742 uh, leading to a huge revolt uh, in the kufa uh, region now marwan was uh, not a very very favorite uh, among the umayyads or even among the non umayyads so he wanted to keep himself safe so that's why he stayed in haran and he had very little say about uh, uh, mecca or he never entered mecca at all to tell you the uh, truth as a caliph he never entered into mecca at all and you would like to comment on that odin 
No, no, I was just pointing that <laughs> your mic was on the oh, yeah. best on the. Um, yeah, actually, while you're there, Odin, I'm gonna, I gonna—I was going to ask you a question. Um, you know, one of the pieces of ev evidence that we we think we have is Saint John of Damascus, who refers to, not mm -hmm. by name, but refers to this location and poo-poos the idea of it being a location for Abraham. But you brought up an interesting idea that this might mightn't actually be really connected with St. John of Damascus. Do you want to talk about that? I, I think if, um, there is a debate among scholars about the datation of John of Damascus, uh, of some of John of Damascus um, writings about Islam, or what was supposed to be t Islam at the time. Um, especially um, the, the, the Mecca question, and the uh, existence of uh, Muhammad as a as a prophet, um, because it's it's a bit odd. It does not fit the um, what we know outside of John of Damascus writings, and also um, we know of John of Damascus writing. We have uh, Greek manuscripts or Greek copies of um, of his writing. Of his writing is is. Um, and he is pointing at Islam as um, a sort of uh, fully formed religion, fully fully fledged religion, and as the last religion, the uh, 99th or the hundreds of um, of his list of heresies. And there is also something very strange. Um, he he was um, a sort of clerk for the Umayyads, and uh, how come um, someone like him? Um, stemming from a, um, a family who served the former Umayyads could write such a harsh critic uh, about Islam without uh, retaliation. Um, this is very strange. So some, some people think uh, that um, a parts of his writing about Islam or proto-Islam might be apro apocryphal. They might have been written in Byzantium uh, in order to, to benefit from the the statue from from the image of John of Damascus. So we are not very sure about the the datation. Thanks, Owen. Um, going to open up the floor to anyone who'd like to just jump in with any thoughts now at this stage. Lloyd, did you want to? Or Paul? Just yeah, uh, just on what, what Odin was saying, it, it is very peculiar, the John of Damascus statement. Um, if he was disrespectful towards the Quran and Muhammad, um, that is something that we could easily try to explain. We could say, well, the Umayyads were, were not fans of Muhammad and the Quran, that they saw it as a threat to their power. Uh, they, they, they tolerated it and they, and they maybe adopted some of the iconography and the, and the uh, terminology like saying um, Muhammad Rasul Allah and, and, and the odd phrase here and there, but they didn't really want to encourage it uh, very much and they were, they were tolerating it and, uh, and um, you know, taking as much of it as they needed to. But what's really interesting about John of Damascus is how little he seems to have known. Uh, it, when one reads that, that famous passage, uh, one gets well, there's, there's, a, there's a conflicting element. On the one hand, he seems that he he doesn't know that there's a book called the Quran. It seems as though he's never read the Quran. He deals with four books as though they are separate books, as though he's not aware that they form part of one tradition, and he doesn't really seem to know about the others. But then, by the same token, he does seem to know the Surah of the Camel, which isn't part of the Quran, as though almost he knows. Um, a book that's since been lost. So it, it is a very, very interesting uh, situation. The disrespect for the Quran and Muhammad, one could, one could accommodate that within any number of different theories. But the fact that he doesn't know the Quran and yet he seems to know something about it that, that nobody else knows is, is very, very interesting. I, I, it, it shows, it seems to show that the Quran manuscripts if they are being produced and they're circulating, they're not making their way to the Umayyad court and the Umayyads are not very keen on people on people reading them. Um, did you want to come in on something, Lloyd? 
your audio? Yes, uh, a couple of Sorry. points I'd like to raise. Um, uh, so in terms of this particular topic, uh, you guys are specialists in the area, and it's actually very enlightening to listen to all three of you um, and yourself as well, Mel. Just, uh, just in terms of Mecca, Islam does claim, if, if people are not familiar, there's with, within the Ijma, within the Sharia of Islam, they do claim that Muhammad's message was final and that Islam abrogates all previous religions. All previous religions, especially Christianity, Judaism, become Din al Battle. So Din al Battle means these are the abrogated, well, technically, these are the worthless religions. These are the religions where your words do not reach Allah. They turn to dust and they fall at your feet. Allah doesn't listen to us anymore. So Islam becomes the Din al Haq, the religion of truth. But actually, the word is, is much more than truth. It's, it's a completely, well, it's got a much deeper meaning than that. But they do say that for Muslims to affirm these, that these, okay, Affirming these religions' validity, but denying or not mentioning their abrogation, it is unbelief or kufr to hold that the remnant cults now bearing the names of formerly valid religions, such as Christianity or Judaism, are acceptable to Allah after he has sent the final messenger to the entire world. This is a matter of which there is no disagreement among Islamic scholars. So if we are unclean, they might have needed to go to a location that was a fresh start to separate themselves mm -hmm. completely with a fresh start because the, this is the official ijma position on on Islam of all religions so christianity is is so battle is worthless it means pointless but also battle is one of the names of satan so we are the religions of satan um, and then on a different point if with with regards to mecca there's some some interesting points that you guys have all raised but if you have a city and and mecca would seem to be standing alone you would obviously want, and one of the things I know that, that Jay discusses, and I think yourself, Odon, as well, are the coins, right, as, as verifiable, very strong evidence. But if you have something that would have stood possibly as a city-state and they claim that it's the, the, the mother of all cities or something of that nature, then you'd, you'd be able to define what, 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 it, what, it, what did its economy consist of, mm -hmm. right? What did it trade? What did it not trade in, right? What form of government did it have? Who were its leaders? Right? There's a whole list of questions you can go through and ask mm -hmm. about any sort of location like that. Right? What was the religion of that location? What was the name of its currency? Right? There's a whole list of questions you can run through. Who was and none of that is available. So so therefore, clearly there's there's an issue. I mean, so if you just apply the same kind of logic you would to if you want to examine the existence of France for argument's sake, what were its borders? When were they established? What was its currency called? And all of these questions have answers. Mecca meets none of these criteria, it fails them. So I, I think basically in terms of one, there was political reasons, there were the historical reasons, and also there's the theological reasons. They needed possibly a fresh start, and that's, that's me. Mm -hmm. Mike? We don't hear you, Mel. Mel? Mel? Sorry. <laughs> Uh, Lloyd, um, a question for you. Um, where do you think the anti-Judeo-Christian laws of wife beating, ha halala marriage, giving a hundred lashes to adulteress, and shutting down, shutting them indoors, etc., come from? I think that's probably your sort of question. Interesting question. Um, yeah. Okay. So the people who make the laws within Islam are called the mujtahids. Now you've got the highest level of mujtahids, the mujtahids mutlaq. Those would be the guys who founded the four schools of fiqh. Hanafi, Hanbali, Maliki, and Shafi, they are the absolute scholars. That's what the Mujtahid Mutlaq, Mujtahid's Mutlaq are. But also, these guys are, all, there's a, um, oh gosh, you know what, there's a word that I need to find, it's not in this book, but very shortly, if you've heard of antinomianism, this means that there are, this is an inversion of the law of God. It's against the law, so it's against the law of God. Now, if Islam has a genuine Gnostic root, or if it has a Gnostic element within it, because it's obviously got its own little shadings on this issue. It believes if if is if Christianity is the Deen al battle if we are the religions of Satan, then Yahweh is Satan, and Allah would be the opposite of Satan. So therefore, they've got to defy the laws of Moses. They've got to defy the laws of of Yahweh. And therefore, they have to do the inversion. They've got to thus defy the laws of the, the Ten Commandments. 
right? So therefore, if it has this, uh, I would say there's a Gnostic element there, which means that they've got to invert all of that because within Islam, if you look at some of the Gnostic elements, they, they do speak of um, Islam believes, for instance, within the, within the Sharia, Islam claims that the earth and all that is within it is cursed, which is very much a Gnostic concept that the world of matter is cursed. So there's, uh, I'll, I'll try and keep it short and end there, but basically it's an inversion of the law of the Old Testament as well as the law of God. It seems to me that related with that is the the need to have an in crowd and an out crowd. So the way you distinguish yourselves from the others is that inversion. Um, I, I was thinking about that actually today. I was thinking about the Muslims who are living in Western countries who have been wearing burqas to distinguish themselves from Westerners, um, and they've covered up their faces, obviously. But since um, the the crisis with COVID and everyone is now masks. I wonder, are they now struggling to distinguish themselves, you know, from the from the other mass people? Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like it's not really about religious identity. It's more about establishing that they're different. Do you know what I mean? It's not necessarily they're following a particular diktat of their religion, but more a case of saying how are we different from the others? Um, anyone like to come in on that? or on any other point. No. <laughs> not especially. Not especially. OK. Um, well, if anyone has got a question for the, the team, um, please feel free. Um, I've got no more questions here from my end. Okay, I think we'll probably wrap it up here. This is probably a good good point to to finish. This so I'd sorry, like to thank. Sorry, Bill, just just uh, <laughs> uh, come in there. I was looking yeah. up because as I'm uh, as I was <laughs> pulling stuff in my eyes, as yeah. uh, you can never get your hand on the on the right snippet of information when you when you need it. But the um, the question about the um, about the wife beating verse for the so called wife beating verse. Uh, Surah 4 verse 34 was the subject of a, of a very interesting article that I read. Um, it was actually published this year. Um, it's, it's by somebody called, called Saqib Hussein, and the article is called The Bitter Lot of the Rebellious Wife, Hierarchy, Obedience and Punishment in Quran 4.34. And... Um, he deals, um, Hussein deals with the um, similarities between the, the uh, so-called wife-beating verse and the practice of a wife leaving a man in the book of Numbers. Um, I've got the, uh, the actual reference. Uh, Numbers uh, chapter 5, uh, verses 1 to 31. And it, it's, too, it's too complex and detailed for me to go into now. But when... I think he, he satisfies me that 434 is not some um, crude, oh, if your wife disobeys you, give her a bit of a slap and, and then she'll come round. That there's a lot, it's a lot more theological than that. Uh, so much of the Quran has meaning, but it's buried very deep and you really need to pick up on the subtle connections between that and other verses. I mean, I, I would say that a lot of the Quran, um, the passages relating to slavery, to uh, having sex with your slaves, to, um, to the violent jihad, uh, can be related um, to passages of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. It's not simply a, a freestyle tyrant making it up as he goes along. There is actually a meaning to this, but it's rather, rather sophisticated uh, to put in that uh, five, five minutes just as you're saying, just as you're saying goodbye. It's a little bit more of a story, but there is actually a, a, a lot more to that verse. I would just like to put that yeah. in there. There's a question here, um, if anyone would like to take it. Mel, can I Oops. have something about the, the wife beating? Yes, yeah. Uh, it, it comes suddenly now to, to my mind, I should have... Uh, thought about it uh, earlier um you see um um i think uh, I've, I've, ma I've made the point with you and in my book and uh, especially it's uh, dr edouard marigales who made this point that at the origins of islam or at least at 
the origins of the Quran and one of the Arab factions, there was a Jewish Nazarene group um, that might have come from the first century, maybe even before. And um, some of um, some of its um, religion, some of its way of thinking can be found in some of the Qumran manuscripts, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, in there, there is um, uh, a manuscript about the, the women, which tells about the, the role of women as being uh, a sort of um, um, handicap. They, they prevent the men from fighting in the cause of God. And because of this, they have to be secluded in the houses, uh, uh, educated, and so on. And this is something, maybe, that um, was brought to the 7th century by the, this uh, Jewish Nazarene group. And this is maybe one of the reasons why we find it in the Quran. Also, in most of the messianist ideologies, the role of women is always lessened. Uh, we don't want women to fun. The ideologist who wants to establish a, a perfect kingdom, a perfect world, uh, see um, womenhood as something that could prevent the warriors from achieving the goal, from uh, establishing God's kingdom on earth, or from making the revolution, for example. And so women, uh, the um, womenhood, the, the role of women is lessened. Uh, so either women, women are um, <coughs> secluded in their homes, or they are made into men, in, into men such as in, um, in Soviet Russia, for example, or in China, in communist China. So um, this is something about the, the wife beating. And also uh, another point, it is about the sex with slaves. Uh, I've done a, a video with Jay Smith on, on this topic, um, um, explaining um, Guillaume D article. Guillaume D is a um, a French uh, Islamologist, uh, very proficient scholar about um, Quranic studies, and he, he proved that um, there had been some interpolation in some uh, surahs about um, the permission to have sex with slaves. And it was uh, an interpolation um, to uh, a sort of, very, at the beginning, those surahs, those passages were, were very Christian-like, um, <clears throat> they, they looked a lot like instructions for catechumens or for monks. And in the middle, an interpolation was, was made in order to permit sex with slaves, uh, telling the, the believers that uh, <clears throat> you have to be chaste, but it's okay to have sex with slaves. So uh, for people who want details, uh, they can find this video on um, uh, J, J. Smith's channel or, or mine. Okay, um, I, I just want to respond to a question that was there, um, which is, when did the pagan Arabs become uh, Muslims? Um, according to Yehudu Nevo, there were pagan sites um, until about the 750s, so it's probably in the early 8th century. Um, there's a point here from Dreamily Resonant Feet. Uh, someone's uh, audio is on there. Audio is on there. Uh, could, could you switch could off your, you audio, off please? your audio, please? Thanks. Um, there was a, a point here from Dreamily Resonant. The name uh, Muawiyah comes from the word Moabite. In Hebrew, Moavi. But in Arabic, they have no V, so they used a W, Muawiyah. Um, any thoughts on that? There are numerous similarities. When we discussed the 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 origin of the Sharia, the development of the Sharia law on your channel, we discussed a number of terms that were borrowed from the original Hebrew words. So, yeah, I'd say there's, it's plausible, certainly. Uh, can I mention something with regards to that previous question, if I may? I'll try and be brief. Absolutely. Uh, there's plenty of doctrine uh, within Islam that talks about antinomianism. They have a name for it, Ibaha. Ibaha 
is the doctrine that allows the higher level scholars to, it's called allowing the forbidden. So the higher level scholars are allowed to break the law. Now, it should be noted that every single law in Islam is, is it's permitted to break it. If you believe you have a reason, you can break. So, so nothing is sacrosanct. Everything is, shall we say, fluid. On top of that, the Sharia, there are two main pillars. There are six main pillars that are identified within the Sharia, but two of them are interesting. One's called Al-Darura Tubi Al-Masuhrat, and the other one is Al-Maqasada Kadumin Al-Wasail. So these basically say necessities permit the forbidden. If you feel it's necessary, you may break the law. You may break, you may, you may do the taboo. You may do what is forbidden, what is haram. And the last one is really interesting. The aims are more important than the means. The ends justify the means. This is one of the pillars of the Sharia. So, so there's plenty. If you look at the doctrine of deception, the doctrine of lying within Islam, the, you have every right to break so so nothing so really islam is built upon this where you're allowed because short version god is logos allah is will if you are the vice regent of allah on earth you can you can practice your will nothing gets in the way of your will so i'll leave it at that yes it's uh, I, I find it um, it's quite interesting in the quran when you're when you're alert to it that the um that god and his prophet seem to use precisely the same language uh, for their own actions as they do for the actions that they're disapproving of. So Satan leads men astray, but God also leads men astray. And uh, the Pharaoh um, tortures people and uses a particular word that is sometimes translated as crucify. Uh, but then God also instructs um is uh, is people to use exactly uses exactly the same phrase the amputation of limbs from opposite sides is something that pharaoh does and something that uh, that the god instructs people to do uh, time and again the uh, the same words uh, god is is the best of plotters they plot but god is the best of plotters and uh, and god's mm -hmm. it's quite striking that he uses that the quran uses precisely the same verbs um for the enemies of of God as as the uh, as God Himself uh, either does or instructs His uh, obedient uh, servants to do. So uh, it's very interesting and ties in a lot. I think with uh, with what Lloyd was saying, the, the what is important. It's a question of allegiance. It's not a question of some actions are objectively good or objectively bad. It's about whose side are you on. Uh, 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 always that. Okay, I just want to um, kind of bring us back to the focus on Mecca here for a moment. Um, one theory that um, some have proposed is that it all started in Jerusalem and then it moved to Petra and then via Petra onto Mecca. I just wanted to throw that out there. Um, it's a thesis that uh, Jay Smith holds to. It's not one I personally hold to, but there's obviously a need to uh, deal with the Qibla question. Does anyone... Uh, want to refer to that whole question of Petra and how it fits into all of this. Uh, who would like to go? Uh, Odin? Uh, yes, I'm... Oh, um, <laughs> let's get on with it. Um, about this Kibla question, this Kibla issue, there is uh, something very interesting in what uh, Dan Gibson discovered, but uh, one has to, to keep in mind that uh, Gibson on only only as material for um, the second half of the 7th century and, and after. And um, there is almost nothing in Gibson discoveries about the early 7th century, which was the beginning of Islam or proto-Islam. And what we... But we have material, I think, that dates from the early 7th century, which is the Quran, not the whole of the Quran, because... Uh, as you know, the Quran is a, um, a very, a very rewritten text and a very edited text. But uh, in the Quran, there is something about the Qibla. Uh, and what we can read in the Quran is that the preacher who speaks urges his audience to change the Qibla, to change the um, orientation of the prayer from the rising sun to Jerusalem and not from Jerusalem to Mecca. The Jerusalem to Mecca change is an invention of the standard Islamic narrative, 
which was made in order to, to fit the, 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 the Mecca issue, to, 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 to force the meaning of the Quran into uh, the, the creation of Mecca as a place of origin. Whereas the literal Quranic text is very clear about the uh, former um, Qibla. It, uh, it tells about the, the people looking at the heavens um, and, and it, it says that you should not look at the... Um, I say it from memory, I'm not a um, uh, Hafiz. Uh, you should not look at the heavens because the rising sun belongs to God. So uh, quit with this tradition because Qibla also means tradition, what was before. It, it doesn't mean um, explicitly uh, direction of prayer. It's like in the Jewish Kabbalah, it's the same root. Uh, and so the text say, quit with, the, with this uh, rising sun Qibla and pray toward the Masjid al-Aram, so pray toward Jerusalem. But if you do this, you will not be like the Jews who already do this. You will not be like the people of the book. So uh, about this Qibla question, there is something that Tam Gison has completely missed which is the Quranic studies. And this is really, really, really what um, uh, all, all I have uh, in terms of critics, uh, in terms of critics uh, about uh, Gibson's work is that um, he, he only looks at what he has found and he doesn't look at the big picture. He doesn't look at the Quranic studies. He doesn't look, for example, at the like other archaeological discoveries and so on. And because of this, uh, his theory about Petra, I think, is flawed. I think it is flawed. He doesn't know, for example, of this previous Qibla change from the Christian tradition of praying toward the rising sun to uh, Jerusalem, which is stated in the Quran. Paul, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, yes. Um, I, I think there's some there's some uh, merit in in the uh, in, in the idea that Petra did play a role in this. I don't think Petra. I, I don't think that Dan Gibson's um, thesis in its detail is correct. And Dan Gibson ta basically takes the Syria, takes the life of Muhammad, and he places it all inside Petra. I don't think I don't think that the life of Muhammad that is told in the Sira ever happened. Um, it may have been created around somebody who knew Petra and who placed all these fictitious events there, but I don't think that it actually happened there. However, Petra may still play a role. Um, I think that Dan Gibson um, has a good point. I'm persuaded that many um, Umayyad uh, buildings were oriented towards Petra. I think the two that I find um, most persuasive are the Dome of the Chain, which is immediately next to the Dome of the Rock, and it's a, it is a, uh, a structure that seems primarily built in order to point people into a particular direction. And the, the places are so close, um, one could just go on Google Earth and draw a line, and it's, and it's absolutely self-evident to me that this is pointing people towards Petra. And the other um, is the Church of the Katisma, which is also very old, and that also has a, a, a Mihrab niche, which again is pointing in the direction of Petra. But there are plenty of other buildings around there, and as you line it up and as you go through them, the um, Great Mosque of Damascus, the Hisham's Palace, which has recently opened to tourists on the West Bank. If you find these, they do all point very closely towards Petra. So Petra seems to have had some significance to the Umayyads. Of course, that doesn't mean it had any significance at all to Muhammad. Um, the other point I would make is that Mecca is mentioned in the Quran. And, um, and what it tells us is that it was in a valley. It talks about an event that happened in the valley of Mecca. And there, there were some, uh, some people that the uh, Quranic audience were preparing to go to battle with, but they ended up forming a, uh, and these people are described as mushrikun. They are described as standing in the way of, or, or turning, turning the Muslims away from Jerusalem. And they are described as, um, uh, 
I forget what the other one was, but they they, they are. Uh, I mean, they might have just have been the two things, and they and they were preparing to go to war, and then um, there seems to have been uh, their hands were turned away from fighting, and the Quran presents this as a great victory. So it's clear from that context that the Quran author, I think, the Quran author went to a valley somewhere, met some enemies that were standing in their way to Jerusalem, and he called that the Valley of Mecca, or Valley of Mecca. Um, and that could be any, any valley, but it could easily be Petra. Um, if Petra was sacred to, or, or special to the Umayyads, the Umayyads may well have been those people, Abu Bakr and so on, may well have been the very people that uh, Muhammad was thinking about fighting and they came to some sort of deal and they stood aside or maybe formed an alliance and then allowed uh, allowed Muhammad to press on to, to invade Palestine. Uh, Petra is the right sort of place, it's a valley and it's clearly of some, of some religious significance to their rivals. So uh, Dan Gibson's work isn't, isn't isn't in vain. I think he's got a lot of um, he's got some interesting findings there, and it's and Petra may well turn out to have quite a role to play in this. Um, Bala, do you want to come in on that? Um, well, Mel, uh, I was just reading the uh, comment section. Uh, two very interesting comments. One was a question asking uh, what is the role of uh, Medina in shaping up the city of Mecca. Because uh, today they're known as twin cities, but nowhere in the previous literature of, let's say, even 800s or 900s are these two cities referred to as twin cities. Because uh, to be uh, referred to as twin cities, both these need to have an origin at uh, the same point in time. And the other uh, comment uh, that is made by someone called Max, uh, you know, he says that Mecca basically means the place of rest. So uh, it just gets corroborated with uh, uh, the modern narrative as well as the standard Islamic narrative that Mecca was a temporary place to hide the, um, you know, the black stone for a while. So it was a temporary place. Now, uh, it became, you know, uh, it, it became permanent and became concretized and, you know, rigidified over the, uh, uh, you know, because of political circumstances over the centuries. And after that, it, it became uh, immutable, uh, like the general religion of Islam itself. But uh, initially, I think it was uh, meant to, uh, for safekeeping from, uh, you know, uh, uh, safekeeping of the Blackstone and the other relics like the Rukne Ibrahim and all those things from the Umayyads. And, the, and then it became a permanent place somehow. Any thoughts on that, Lloyd? <laughs> Lloyd, with your audio? I uh, no, I'd have to go and research that before I would comment. I need to spend some time digging deeper. But uh, I've learned a great deal on this show as well already. Some something maybe here. Um, I'm not that knowledgeable about uh, Medina and 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 what happens there. But there is something uh, very strange when Bala is talking about the, the Twin Cities. Um, when, when we look at what the, the standard Islamic narrative is telling us about Mecca, it's supposed to be the place of origin and it is it's supposed to be the place of merchants and trade. So uh, one would, could assume that uh, with the victory of the Arabs and the establishment of the, the Caliphate, Mecca should have prospered and, and Meccan trade should have boomed. But there is absolutely no trace of a Meccan trade even after the, the Arab conquest, which is very, very, very odd. There is a trace of a Meccan slave trade in the 19th century, but that's all. And there is nothing with Mecca so uh, and it is even in, in in a way it is even in the standard Islamic narrative, uh, all the the, the Qurayshi victorious Arabs, uh, none of them came back to Mecca. The caliph, the first uh, so-called Rashidun caliphs, 
uh, route from Medina and they never went back to Mecca. Uh, and so this is um, a clue that Mecca <laughs> did not exist at the time. And um, another thing about Mecca, and, and I think it should be uh, said in our, in our chat, um, there was never um, a consensus about Mecca among the, the, the Muslim scholars of the 9th or 10th century. There was a very harsh debate among themselves about the, the, the Mecca question that was looked upon as a, a rida, um, an innovation. And there was an, an, a very <laughs> tragic and uh, enormous event in the 10th century a faction of Muslims, the Karmatians, they were uh, some sort of Shia Muslims, um, did not agree with the Mecca being uh, erected as uh, the place of origin and the city of the Prophet. And they, <coughs> they, they were uh, located uh, um, in the western shore of the Persian Gulf. So in the other side, the um, eastern side of Arabia and they went through the deserts to Mecca and ransacked the place, uh, destroyed everything, filled the Zamzam well with, uh, with bodies and they stole the black stone. So um, we see that they, <laughs> the Muslim did not agree about the, 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 the status of, of Mecca uh, even in the 10th century or 11th century. And the black stone that we see today, we are not sure whether it is the actual true black stone because it was recovered from the Karmatians something like 70 years ago after the, the, the sacking, the sack of, the, of Mecca by the Abbasid Caliph who, who paid a good ransom to, to get it back. So maybe, maybe it was at this time it, that it was shattered into several pieces. But, but still, we cannot be sure that it is the real, actual Blackstone. I just want to um, share a thought there. One of the most inaccessible places in the world is probably the summit of Everest. And yet there are more artifacts up there on the summit just from the past hundred years than there has been in Mecca for all that period, which would suggest that <laughs> very few people have been going there over the centuries. Otherwise, we should see an awful lot of inscriptions and and uh, little monuments and so on built there from all of these millions and millions of pilgrims over the centuries. Um, I know Bala wants to come in, so I'm just going to pass it to you, Bala. Um, I wanted to uh, confirm what Odon uh, said. See, uh, there were this uh, cult of these, um, you know, proto-communists or proto-Bolsheviks called the Karmatians. The Karmatians actually... Mm -hmm wanted to shift the Qibla to their uh, homeland in Bahrain. Uh, so they uh, invade Mecca, which is forbidden actually. And they take away the black stone and all the other relics uh, to their place in the hope of shifting the Qibla of the entire Islamic world towards uh, their homeland, uh, in which they uh, fail miserably. The man who did it is called Tahir bin Sulaiman. Uh, he did that in the early 10th century, uh, only to return back after some uh, 36 years or something, uh, he returns it back uh, at the uh, mosque of Basra. He throws the uh, black stone uh, tied up in a sack uh, where it is broken into seven pieces. Now, these uh, pieces are amalgamated together using some kind of uh, uh, a gel or something or a cementing substance and it yeah. is kept back at Mecca and, 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 the, and the cube is rebuilt actually. The cube, the, the cube itself is rebuilt the uh, seven times. So one does not need to keep uh, today's uh, picture in mind if you have to think of uh, uh, the seventh century. So well, what we have in front of us is basically an uh, illusion. So it's very difficult to mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, take out what was real and what was false. Uh, what, what, one, what one can say is uh, the early uh, membership to the believers movement was uh, that you had to have a certain number of beliefs and you could follow your own religion of uh, uh, Judaism or Christianity or 
Zoroastrianism or anything. But the later membership became, uh, you know, the Jews, the Christians, and the Zoroastrians and the Manichaeans left the believers' movement uh, by the 690s because it it had retained too many pagan elements in it, and it was irreconcilable with uh, their own uh, uh, personal religion, as well as the fact that the apocalypse was not arriving. And this prophet was not getting resurrected, and his companions were not getting resurrected. So all these points were running in the minds of uh, the early uh, believers who left the movement. And by the year 820 or 830, there were no more Jews at all uh, left in the fold of uh, Islam anymore. So from then onwards, uh, Islam uh, becomes a independent cult or religion, as you want to call it. And and as it is, the Christians had left very well uh, by uh, after the death of Muawiyah. Uh, as we can see, John of Damascus is a, uh, a greatest critique of early Islam. And and, and the other uh, people, uh, like the Zoroastrians, obviously hated uh, Muslims, let's say, around from 640 onwards. So uh, the exit uh, of uh, the non-Muslim believers uh, was clearly evident. And uh, uh, they nobody approved of uh, Mecca as a holy place. And, Nobody made pilgrimage to it. I mean, the Jews, the Christians, and the Zoroastrian believers never made a pilgrimage to Mecca. We must remember. Thank you. Um, there's a question here. Why is the uh, Saudi Arabia very reserved when it comes to giving access to archaeologists? Would anyone like to... Anything well, that embarrasses uh, Islam, basically, Islam is forbidden. Islam, is forbidden. No, Islam basically hates archaeology, you know? Uh, it wants you to get disconnected from your past. Uh, it wants you to forget that your uh, forefathers were uh, Christians or your forefathers were Hindus. Look, you can change your religion, but you can't change your forefathers' religions and their beliefs. They're dead and they're gone. They lived by their convictions and they died for it. So uh, not only the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, uh, Muslims discourage archaeology in Jordan and they don't allow digging around the Temple Mount. If there is one proper uh, archaeological dig around the Temple Mount and around Jerusalem. The whole truth about uh, Islam will come up and um, Islam will show up uh, to be uh, much less younger. If you perceive it to be 1400, I would call it that it is uh, only 900,000 years old because I believe true Islam began only with uh, someone like uh, Al-Ghazali. Thank you. Okay, Odin, do you want to jump in on that one? Uh, I fully agree with Bala. This is also what I wanted to say. But uh, with Prince bin Salman and e even before him, there have been a sort of opening uh, to archaeology, but not in Mecca, not in Medina, not in the sacred sites. But there is um, uh, archaeological work in the north, in Madain Saleh, for example. And in France, there have been numerous um, expositions uh, of archaeological remains and, and discoveries. Um, but I, I think the Saudis uh, allows it because it shows the Jahiliya, the so-called so Jahiliya. It shows the, the way their forefathers, who were supposed to, the, their pagan forefathers, forefathers uh, lived. So it is kind of uh, in accordance with Islam. Yeah, I'd like uh, just to mention, I could uh, we, we, we've been mentioning or talking about the lack of evidence for mecca uh, when it comes to yatrib there is documentary evidence yatrib did exist however on the subject of archaeology um one question that I, i've never heard anyone provide an answer for if there are any muslim viewers out there who, who have an answer i said where is the trench according to the traditional narrative um Muhammad, dug a, a, a great trench around uh, around uh, Yatrib, around Medina, and this trench must have been wide enough and deep enough to hold an army at bay. So it can't just be a few feet, it can't be something that you can leap over. It must be something that was so big that, that an invading army would get held up by it by, for a significant period of time. Uh, yet one can go on as uh, as i say back on google earth again if we can go onto google earth and have a look at it there's nowhere obvious where such a tre trench could possibly have been created it doesn't the landscape doesn't lend itself to to that but in any event um there's no sign of a trench i mean 
who went and filled it in <laughs> to destroy the evidence. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, uh, we don't find the uh, crack or the uh, split of the moon and the trench. Both are just absent. I think they're just only uh, in books and uh, in, mm -hmm. in folklore. It's also the same with the Battle of Badr. Ba there is a huge stories. There are huge stories about this battle, but it is uh, it has it was invented only to fit a certain verse where there is Badr. But uh, I, I know a French scholar, uh, Aramaic and you know, Hebrew scholars, who made a translation of the Quran, a bit like um, Christoph Luxemburg, but before him. And, um, and he, 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 he thought that the Badr meant something else, and that the, um, the Muslim invented the story of the battle, because they, either they did not know what the verse meant, or they wanted to, to be creative. And it's the same with so many stories about um, early Islam, uh, especially, for example, the Mount Arafat. Arafat, there is only one uh, mention, one occurrence of this in the Quran. And uh, if we look into it, it, it could be read differently without being a mount, the Mount Arafat. Arafat is a uh, there is, it is an, an Aramaic root. Uh, it is about banking or, or trading. And the verse is, um, is telling the, the believers that when they come to Jerusalem, it is fine for them to sell their goods and their slaves before coming to the Masjid al-Aram. This could be the actual, original um, meaning of the verse, but it was transformed by the Islamic narrative and he invented uh, a Mount Arafat, and nowadays there is a Mount of Arafat, uh, Arafat in, in Mecca. Yes, I think, um, he, um, Odin, you mentioned uh, Christoph Luxemburg, and I think his translation was that uh, Badra or, 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 um, or some uh, word or combination of words that, that fits the continental skeleton uh, reads an auxiliary troop. Didn't he? And he said that uh, the auxiliary mm -hmm. troop, the battle of the auxiliary troop, ties in ex ex extremely well with the uh, with the way the Quran presents it, which is that um, uh, God sent down three thousand angels to fight with the Muslims when they were mm -hmm. when they were lowly, and that's, it fits the context of the verse perfectly. That it was a uh, it was an auxiliary troop, not a uh, not the name of a place. Uh, Lloyd, from add something. Um... It is illegal to embarrass Islam. It technically can be construed as treason if it's an insult to Allah. And Muslims have to make a calculus before they before they state anything. If the truth would cause more harm than the lie, then it is obligatory for Muslims to lie. This is the Sharia law. On top of that, in terms of some of the embellishment, Islam has a doctrine called, well, it's actually a rhetorical, quote unquote, science, the science, rhetorical science called the Illam al-Badi, which is about the beautification of literary style, and it's about the artifice and the ornamentation and embellishment, or the artifices of ornamentation and embellishment of speech. So it's part of the culture. It's one of the sciences. How to use artifice, which is deception, rhetoric, deceit, lies, to embellish speech. On top of that, if you look at the tradition, if you go back within to the Jahliya, right, into the condition of ignorance that that during that period, it was very normal. Well, they believed that when, when, when people died, good or bad, you ended up in the same place and it was a horrible place to go to. So the only way that you had a life to look forward to was if you were remembered in poetry. So the only way that you would be remembered was in poetry. So you wanted to commit acts or deeds or tell a story in such a way that it would re be remembered within the poetry. And, and this tradition has obviously bled through and maintained its way into the Quran and to, into the uh, the traditions of Muhammad. So they're allowed to embellish. They're allowed to exaggerate to that degree if it, if it benefits Islam. And then also, just one last point. What happened was poets were said to be mad. Now, you know that I think Quran 35, 37 calls Muhammad a mad poet. Now, the poets of the Jahiliya were said to often be mad. They were, they were driven mad because they were great poets, but they were said to be driven mad because they each would have a muse, and the muse was a demon called a jinn. 
and the jinn would inspire that poet and give him his words and allow him to speak and allow him to create this great poetry. So th this would be so this might be something. It's part of the tradition that comes out of the jahiliyyah that's now continued. Mm -hmm. Anyone like to jump in there? I'm, I'm just holding. We're all, all in the middle of researching. Um, <laughs> There's some great um, comments in the... No, I'm just reading the comments. Yeah. yeah. And I'm yeah. trying to reply to our friends in the in the, in the chat box because they're coming up with uh, a lot of uh, uh, nice statements. And 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 uh, one of that is... One of that is the uh, idea that uh, um, the, the archaeology, again, the archaeology and Islam don't go well and... They don't do archaeology at all in any of the uh, countries which come under their domain, be it Iran or even Pakistan or as far as Morocco also. Uh, so that, that is a, a, a very, very well-established fact that is mentioned by our friends in the comment section. I'm trying to reply to most of them. Uh, but, uh, but, but the point is, uh, Mecca becomes the epicenter of Islam and in hindsight, if we see during the Mughal, uh, the Mongol invasion of Hulago, they reach up to Jerusalem. The Mongols reach up to uh, Jerusalem, but then they are not uh, uh, able to uh, go near Mecca. So the Muslims pat themselves in the back after the victory of uh, Rukhnuddin Barabbas in 1261-1262. Uh, so uh, in hindsight, keeping Mecca there was good because if they had Mecca somewhere near Baghdad or somewhere near Jerusalem, Mecca there was good because if they had Mecca somewhere near Baghdad or somewhere near Jerusalem, it would have been overrun by the Mongols and some would have lost its validity as the final and immortal religion. So in hindsight, uh, they felt it's good to keep it deep, deep, deep in the desert, way far away from the uh, hands of the enemies. I just want to read, sorry, I just want to read a comment from Chris Klaus. Uh, this is an awesome panel, tons of great info. We're blessed today. Uh, thank you, Klaus, for that very kind comment. And I think... That's a good reflection of a lot of the, the comments. And uh, I think it's been a fun, fascinating discussion. Um, it's not one that I've been able to take part in because I was uh, trying to act as host. I don't know if I've done a good job or not, but it's uh, uh, it's, it's a bit like um, juggling in the air, trying to keep an eye on everything. But um, I, th I thought it was really fascinating, all of the, the uh, different contributions. I think we've lost Odin. Maybe it's an internet. Oh, he's back. There we go. Sorry, um, so technical incidents. <laughs> okay I figure now. that. Yeah. So um, I, I just think it's been a, a fascinating discussion. I think you've given us a lot of food for thought. Um, I think it, you know, for anyone interested in the question of why did they move everything down to Mecca, I think there's there's loads of ideas, and I think the truth is in there in the mix. Um, we may not have it all mm -hmm. sorted. We may not have all the answers, but we certainly have got. A substantial part of the answer and i'm sure there'll be opportunities in the future for us all to gather again hopefully with jay smith the next time who's um happily climbing up some mountain somewhere in the united states, united at, the states at the minute yeah. so um so, uh, i'm sure i'm sure um, um, uh, i request all the panelists here and also the future speakers to have a session or a couple of sessions of uh, how and why uh, India uh, never became uh, Islamized, or rather the topic should be India and, and uh, Islam and uh, how we uh, Indians, uh, you know, uh, withstood Islamic uh, invasions and retained our uh, freedom successfully, you know, because um, only very few nations have been able to resist Islam, like let's say Burma, India, Spain, or today's Israel. So I think you need to talk uh, about India's, the India story with and its clash with Islam. So I kindly request all of you to participate in it and mail to host it someday. Thank you. I would be more than happy. And I think there, there have been a number of viewers who've actually requested that. It's very much outside of my field of knowledge. Um, so um, I'm, I don't know how the others feel, but um, perhaps there, in addition to yourself, Bala, there are viewers from India who, who are knowledgeable in that history. Um, and if 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 you're watching and you'd like to take part in that just
get in touch. Lost everyone. <laughs> um, I think this this might be worth doing on a regular basis, maybe once a month or every five or six weeks. Um, it's good to bring everyone together and to really kind of nail uh, a particular topic and bring all your expertise to bear. Um, it's fantastic. And and Robert Spencer, I see someone mentioned Robert Spencer. I think I'd love to bring him on. I think that I think he would be a very interesting individual to bring on and uh, and uh, share his knowledge. Um, so um, thank you guys. Um, it's been fascinating. And thank you so much for uh, taking part. Um, if any of you would like to kind of uh, have a closing comment, now's your opportunity. I think my, my closing comment, Mel, would be thank you very much for A, for being such, uh, such an excellent host and, and also for getting us all together in the first place. I think it's been a, a very, very worthwhile exercise. It's been a, a mm -hmm. the, I think it's been a, possibly the most successful um collaboration uh discussion between us because we, we've tried it before and it hasn't always worked out um but, but it's worked very well today i think and uh, thank, thank you, you very both. much for, thank you very much for doing that i think one of the, you mentioned that there are a lot of ideas there different people have different starting positions and different conclusions and so it's actually quite difficult for people to share their ideas or critique one particular idea because people have such different uh, frames of reference but i think it's been very successful today and thank you very much for that oh thank you paul thank you thank you man uh no, thank you you see w when we are doing uh, research there is no absolute truth we have to confront um, our different point of views we have to accept that we do not hold the truth and to hear everyone and to 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 make the better of it uh, this is how it works. Absolutely. So thanks, thanks, thank you, Mel. Well, thank you, Mel. Thank you much. Appreciate it. Really good to meet you two gentlemen as well. Thank you. I learned a great deal from both of you. Great. Hope to hope to uh, chat again soon, Lloyd. Yeah, I think there's a great um, there's a great benefit from uh, bringing people together and having ideas bounce off each other because. It can open up new avenues of research and uh, and just just to get to know each other and uh, know that there's other people who are in the same field is very helpful. So thank you guys. Um, hopefully next time we will have Murad and we'll have Jay and uh, maybe we could take on the the question of India's history mm -hmm. um, or another question as well in the future. So thank you guys and uh, talk to you all very soon. And thank you to all the kind comments in the in the chat today. Okay, bye everyone. Bye.